first TV shows that I ever auditioned for. I'm positive, Glenn, I mean, I didn't audition for Glenn, but I did audition for Black Jack Savage way back. I was, I was like 20 or, for what part? I didn't know. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, for, I don't know, the main part. I guess. Yeah, I don't Black know. Jack Savage? Yeah, you were up for I was up for Black Jack Savage. No, whatever, uh, uh, whatever the female part is. I don't really remember. I just remember that I, I mean, I did audition at Cano a lot. They had a lot of shows. Oh yeah, Roma Downey. I mean, practically the same person. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was really young. I, I think I was probably only 20 at the time, so I was probably still even at that time too young for that part. But um, you know, it was one of the first things I ever auditioned for. Um, Glenn says I didn't, but I did. Um, but I came in an audition for Space, and. Uh, the story that I always tell, I think the first thing that Glenn ever said to me, I, I ran the stone, I, I had, I, I auditioned for everything, and I knew Randy from casting from forever, and um, you know, I probably read for the X-Files, and so he just kind of always kept me in mind, he was just like a great champion, I mean we can't talk about Randy Stone was such a, I, I'm not going to talk too much about it because I'll start to cry, but he was amazing. And um, so he was, he, when I had read the pilot of space, I don't know if there's a lot of space fans here, but when I had read the, when I had read the pilot for it, I thought, I was in my, I was in my mid-twenties, I guess, at the time, and I felt like she was really young. That character was like, you know, probably, not that far out of high school, you know, she, she probably had left high school and um, joined up. So I already felt like I was a little bit old for the part. And then there, and, and I was like, you know, I'm not going to get this. I'm not going to go. I, I had planned to go away for the holidays to visit my mom. And um, I was like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to get it. I, I'm going to leave early. And my agent was like, no, Randy insists that you come and keep, but he, he insists that you audition for this, but he wants to see you first. And I was like, uh, okay. He's like, he just wants to make sure that you guys are on the same page about it. He thinks you're going to get this part. And I was like, all right. So I went and I auditioned, and there was a part in it where um, Shane, uh, Shane and Cooper are exchanging words, and he uh, looks at the scar on her hand, and she begins to, and he tries to kiss her, and she cries. In the script, she cries. And I went in there, and I was like, she, she doesn't cry. I was like, Shane doesn't cry, and because a guy comes on her, she would just punch him in the face or whatever. She would not do that. And um, so he was like, yes. Don't cry, and that was ended up being part of the way that I got the part. Is like I was the one who didn't cry for once. And then when I was walking out of the audition, I just hear as I'm walking out, I just hear somebody. Because I, I think you were sitting, you were kind of sitting off in a way by yourself. Sure. Huh? I don't know. He, so I was walking out, and when I hear him say something, and he's like. Uh, I, you know, Glenn's very soft spoken, and he said something to me, and I said, Excuse me? And he said, I love you on Cheers. <laughs> and uh, that was, that, that was one of the first words that Glenn ever said to me. <laughs> so I always think that's a funny story. And that was television history made. <laughs> yeah. right there. I don't know about that. Oh, well, I. I we. Um, what, how, uh, how we met. That was how we met. Thank you. Thank you. All three of you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody hated auditioning for you and I because, like this, they could go, hey, I'm still up. Uh, you know, it was good. <laughs> yeah, I for sure did not think that I got the part. I was like, well, now I can leave on my vacation. It, you know, Glenn and Jim in a room are like, thanks, that was great. <laughs> they, they even said that much. You know, so yeah. You were so close to all of us going to your room. <laughs> Jim, I loved you on Cheers. <laughs> okay, I got it. Can I share? Can I share? Uh, I have a thing.
thing I want to do, because I'll just make them up later. Uh, so, on the count of three, I would like everybody to say the name of their favorite episode. Out loud. Okay, I'll say it. And if you don't know the title, I'll say like, oh, it's like some magic. If you don't know the title? No, I just, okay. Okay, so on three, I'm going to say uh, your, your favorite. All time episode of this. Ready? One, two, three. Bye. Mind is who?
the writers room, I think, came around in the, the uh, yeah, comedy we, always had writers room. We never had a writers room per se, because what we did was just uh, present our ideas for the episode, and then we just go off and write the episodes. So each group of writers, like Alice and, and Howard, Chris by himself, us, um, we would just, you know, say, well, we want to do this, we, what we had was a major, a big board that, that said, episode one is this, episode two is this, episode three, you know, so we had this idea of this rotation, so we didn't want to do like two monsters in a row, or, um, so that was our board, it wasn't a board where we broke the stories down, and what we would get was we pitched the stories to each other, and then, you know, you go off and write, so it was, a, it was really a, Sure. The writer's room kind of came along and things got really serialized because yeah. they were a standalone. Um, you you kind of didn't need that. So then, when your favorite lead actors became with Child, <laughs> which was around April, early on that year, we were like, uh oh. And we all came up with the abduction thing that she would disappear around the time that Jillian was going to have her baby. And that's when the mythology kind of came around by necessity and by accident. I think whatever, I'm sorry, I think one breath, like, yeah, you're back, but you're laying on a table. That's, <laughs> that's all she does, because she had just had the babies, and her, her breasts in that episode are, you know, like, you know, if you had CGI, I think you were interested. But so, you know, a lot of people might go, Yes, and then I did this, and then it wasn't that brilliant. It's like the amount of accidents or things that arose that we just had to, you know. Yeah, I mean, yes. I, I do remember that when we first met on X Files, the first question was, "Is this a UFO show?" Um, a week, Chris, the first answer was yes, and then like he come he come back like. Couple days later, goes no. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be honest enough that we were so split, not not split, um, so like each of us sort of produced our own thing. Yeah. And you'd read the script or whatever, and you know, at 22 episodes it becomes insane. And so I remember, at the point of this, like one day I was in my office, I'm doing something, and I'm looking at dailies, I'm looking at dailies, and it was like that last episode of the year, and I'm like, look up, and like. They killed Deep Throat! <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. I can't not ask you this question just because of how my problem is. All four of you have, um, I have such a love for season two of the and all four of you on stage. Just very quickly, what were your favorite ones for working on that season? Everyone's at which? Season two of the Madness. Oh, Eleni. What is it show about? Oh, sorry. Oh, thanks for reminding me. Thank you very much. And don't miss that. I think there's a panel with that with Chris and Troy. But we're talking about why you hire people. And not just because, you know, we're family. All of us have killed a lot of characters in really weird ways and a lot of people have lost their minds, and you really have to trust an actor. And that episode, it's like the next to last of season two, where she goes crazy. I mean, that's always like, we always like laugh. Kristen goes, he always kills me. <laughs> but it's because she can do it, because you're gonna ask an actor. Uh, that episode, sorry, we've jumped into Millennium. That episode of Millennium was like improvised. But the director and the camera guys just, throwing shit at her and putting her in the shower with ink and all this kind of stuff and she just did it. You didn't have somebody who walked off, you know. She was just uh, like, yeah. No, 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 no. I, I feel really, really lucky um, that Glenn and I have that kind of, I mean, we're just, you know, we're just lucky to have, you know, that Glenn and Jim trusted me. Um, so many times to do weird stuff. Um, I mean, they're really hard, and, and uh, I think it would be really, I always say, you know, it's, people say, oh, your, you know, your husband gives you parts, but it's a, it's a real collaboration, because like Glenn said, you, it would be very difficult to audition 
to do that. You know, you couldn't really audition to do Feel Where I Died. You know, you, that would be very hard. It would be really hard to um, hire, you know, to have written that scene for somebody who um, you didn't, the end of the millennium thing, for someone that you didn't know what they could do in advance. So I think there's, it's a, it's a real collaboration, it's a real conversation that, you know, I feel really lucky to have with, with um, Glenn and, and Jim, and um, I feel, you know, eternally grateful to have had those opportunities to do that. And that, and that was, it was like, the, the, that episode was just the crew and I, and Tom Wright, who is um, one of our favorite people and directors, he's still a really great friend of ours, and one of the greatest TV directors, I think, of, of all time. Like, he's just so, to work with him is, is really amazing. His storyboard art, if you ever have a chance to see his artwork, he's just extraordinary. I mean, he, 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 did, he did a lot of the um, paintings for the Night Gallery, the show The Night Gallery. He, he did the paint, he, and he was a, a storyboard artist for Hitchcock, and um, he did artwork for Jaws, and he's just an extraordinary artist. And uh, he had storyboarded all the sequences of how that episode, would, how that um, act was going to go. It was a full act, and um, there were at, at that time they don't. I've seen it actually used a couple times. Uh, Mike Wrench was the camera operator, and he, he, you know, we had worked with him a bunch, a lot, so I was really familiar with the crew. Um, we were friends, and because I, the, the other part of working as the executive producer's wife is that you're not just an actor, you're also, you represent your husband. So you're not really, you know, people say, oh, she gets away with, you get away with zero possible things. You cannot be late, you mm -hmm. cannot, because I reflect badly on, on Glenn. So I have to show up, I have to be fully committed, I have to love it, you know, <laughs> even when it's really, you know, so, so my, <laughs> So, uh, Mike Wrench, um, he, he talks about always, as the camera operator, that the camera is an actor. That's how he approaches it. But on that day, that camera, <laughs> that camera was a very cheeky actor because it, there was this squishy cam and I had to crawl into this thing. You know, and I'm, again, crying all day long. It's just, I'm having a nervous breakdown and it's all in these little snippets of things. So every day I would have to show up and, you know, have a nervous breakdown in this little snippet of thing and then come back and have another nervous, so it's just a whole day of all that stuff. And at one point I have to crawl on the floor and my, if there's, there's no people, there, I'm not acting with anyone, it all has to happen in my head. And my wrench has this squishy cam, which is a, it, it Julie can maybe, maybe, you know the squishy cam? So it, it kind of looks like a spaceship. It's like this thing, it's about this wide, it has a, uh, the lens is in the middle, but you hold it like this. And he was crawling on the floor and doing this squishy cam on my face, and he's laughing so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and like, oh, oh, you know what I'm crying? Uh, and he, he can't even help himself. He's just laughing right in my face. <laughs> and that was like kind of how it went. They drowned me in black water, and you know, it was, it was, it was crazy. It was just me and the crew. And, they, and at a certain point, they did not care that I was having a nervous breakdown. They would just walk around me and step over me. And, yeah. um, but it was, I really, all that being said, I feel really grateful to have had that opportunity. A lot of actors never get to do that. So, and you know, all that being said, I feel really fortunate to have been able to do it. All right, now I know I've been talking this week. A lot of you guys write and jump on in. This is how I wrote an Excel. I used to get this, you know, this, you know, they had the internet, but it was really well, really, and it was more than that, but that's what you had. And I would get a subscription to this thing like Science News. It was really a pamphlet. It was never, every came every Monday. 
um, like six pages long. And you look through it, you look through it, and they go, oh, they just pulled out the record for the deepest ice core they pulled out of Greenland or whatever. Oh, that's cool. Jim would go to our eye doctor, may he rest in peace. Um, and he might go, oh, there's these worms, and they go in your eyes. I always ask Dr. Matsumoto, what's some weird shit with eyes? <laughs> and he, was he was a science fiction guy, and he would be like, oh, well, there's this and there's that. Then you just, out in the world, or you, you'd sit in a room and honestly go, you know, um, for me, worms bother me, snakes bother me, so no arms, or too many arms, like no penis, <laughs> I don't want it. So, if you're honest, with yourself, you writers out there. This scares me. I don't like this. Put it in a show because you'll come to a thing like this later and go, snakes and no beans freak me out too. And then Chris takes that story. <laughs> um, and so then you'd sit in a room and go, uh, we loved both Howard, he didn't direct it, but Howard Hawks is the thing, and John Carpenter's the thing is a masterpiece. And as a writer, you're always trying, you know, in college or in writing class, like, they're in an elevator, uh, they're out, and the phone doesn't work, you know, you're always trying to isolate them. So instead of Antarctic, we went to the Arctic, and like, how can we keep it? We thought it would be a small show, you know, for the, the, for the budget, and just have one set, and then you get up there, and the set is like as big as this uh, room. And so, you know, and then you just, uh, well, then this guy likes the Chargers, and then you just sit there, and what we had, uh, everybody, uh, well, that's more than that, a board with uh, paper index cards, so that Jim and I could sit there, and everybody go, well, this happens, and put that up there, and then you could look at it and go, you know, what if that happened over here, and then you move it, and you go over and over it, and it seems to make sense, and then we bring in Chris and Alex, and uh, who would never understand it. <laughs> How did they get to the art <laughs> and, and stuff like that. And so there's always a mixture of stuff you've read. And then, oh, uh, we were saying to somebody else, if it was medicine, I, we had to write it down. And once a week, go to the UCLA Medical Library and go down to the bowels and look through these journals and stuff where now you just look it up and, and move on. And so. I think that's how we did it. The one story I like is that uh, the second year, Howard and Alex had gone their separate ways, and Alex was like, I can come, I don't know, I don't think, I don't think. We go, no, how? You know, in National Geographic, you always see a snake, and then you got a snake, ah, it opens its mouth, and it eats a deer. We got to do that, but with a guy. So, you know, that's good. And then he, he goes away for a week or two, and he comes back, and goes, I can't work. That'll never work. And Chip and I are like, I'm away from something cocky. And we wrote on an index card in front of him, snake eats a guy. And I'm like, Jim? And he goes, end of act three. <laughs> you know, really? So then the whole episode, is just we sat there going, how could a snake eat a guy? And all that, <laughs> and all that stuff. So they all came in various ways. And Chris would show up one morning and goes, I, I, I have this idea. And you go, oh, that's cool. And you might throw in a couple things. And he went off his, and then we did the board, which is, other shows I've gone on, people ask about the board, like it's some brilliant thing that we made up, but it's been around since writers and TV and movies have been doing it. And that, you know, each one has a different thing. And we talked about home yesterday, but I mean, that's kind of, um, seems like that's how the process went. I, I have a thought experiment for you. I'm changing. Um, yeah, but I'm changing the topics from writing to to editing experiment. It's a thought experiment that you can try later on after you leave this place. Uh, because this is what it was like for, for me and Glenn, especially. I'm not so sure about Chris, uh, but in cutting cutting your episodes, because uh, our our my episodes were always way too long. They were longer than the amount. You have a very specific for network TV show. It's like 43 minutes, 11 seconds, exactly. My episodes were always, always at least five minutes too long. Glenn's, uh, you're usually were long. But one breath was 16 minutes. 16 minutes. Wow. Uh, 
Chris's scripts are a bit tighter, so I don't know if Chris has that same problems that we do, but this is your thought experiment. So next time you watch your favorite all-time excellent episode, which I assume will be later on tonight, <laughs> at home, after spending a whole weekend, nothing but X-Files, you're just gonna watch more X-Files. Yeah. Next time you watch your favorite episode, imagine you have to cut two minutes out of it. What two minutes would you cut out? And this is what this is this is the process you will go through. Okay, you'll go. At first you go, oh no, I can't, I can't cut anything. It's perfect. It's perfect as it is. Can't lose a second of this. You no, know, it's a network show. It has to be this amount, two minutes exactly. You have to cut. And you go, okay. This this episode is perfect. I love it in every way. But there's always been this one scene that I always thought was kind of bad. So, I, like, I think I'm going to cut that scene out. And uh, I think that's uh, like probably about two minutes. So you watch the scene to time it, and it is the scene that you hate. It's two minutes exactly. But in watching it now, this time, you realize, I can't cut this scene out. <laughs> it, it explains the whole plot. <laughs> See, none of, the, none of the episode will make any sense. So you're stuck. You're stuck with a crappy episode, with a crappy scene. So you go, okay, now, now what can I do? And you go, well, oh, there's another scene that's almost as bad, even though this episode is perfect. There's another scene that's, that's pretty bad scene. Uh, so you, you rewatch it to see if you can lose that scene. And then you'll watch the scene and you go, oh yeah, see, there, there's no reason for this scene to be in there. The story will make sense when you cut it out. I'm going to cut out that scene. It's going to be like two minutes probably, and then you time it and it's 17 seconds. <laughs> How can a scene only be 17 seconds long? Well, that's it's 17, so you still have you know a minute 45 to cut out. Then you'll watch, you'll watch the episode and you'll go, <coughs> why do we need this one? Or do we need this? Why, why does he have to leave the room? Why don't we just cut when he slams the phone down? Right? You find little pieces going, okay, we can lose like two seconds right there, and three right there. And as you go in, you get down to a minute, you're going, I'm improving this episode. <laughs> I thought it was perfect, but like it was kind of flabby, and now it's like moving. But then you get down to the last minute. You've got to lose one minute, and this, that's when you start crying. <laughs> you start losing some of your favorite lines, because you go, I love this line. It's like, it works, but I can lose it and still Thing that makes sense, and I have so many lines, so many jokes that I go, Oh, this is a great line. Nobody ever saw, you know, it's, it's a bit heartbreaking. And the <coughs> question last night for the panel, someone was like, what, what would you change if you had to go back one of your episodes? What would you change? And I go, The biggest mistake I think I, I ever made was on the cockroach episode because it was long. I cut out the company's mother. The company's mother was in was in that episode. She was in the crowd scene at the end, and because uh, she had been on the set the whole week, and so we were shooting the scene. And Kim goes, you know, I, I forget I forget David's mother's uh, name. She goes, you know, get the shot, right? So she's in the crowd scene, and it featured very prominently in the thing, and then the camera moved off, and there was a fire engine and followed the fire people to the explosion and stuff like that. And it took so long to go from the shot of the mom. Going over to the thing, and then the scene started. That was like 17 seconds long, and I go, I have to cut. I have to cut. It was too much time, and so I cut the company's model out of the episode. And if I had left her in, I know that would be everybody's favorite episode. And you know, and you know, the, the episode with the company's mom. And then after I cut her out, David called me up and he said, he just went, uh, so uh, you cut my mom out. <laughs> I go, she's got to learn, this is a tough business. <laughs> but, but try that, you'll see how painful it is. You, know, you, won't have a, you won't have an editing machine, but you can like, time each scene and go, it's really brutal. And that's another difference with the show. We're a network show, not a cable show. And uh, it always drives me crazy when I watch cable shows that are still like, like an hour long. And you record the piece, you know, you record a DVD, and it's uh, an hour and three three minutes. It's not like an hour and you go, wow, they had three extra minutes. And then it's, it doesn't matter at that time. And then you watch the episode, you go, they didn't need three extra minutes. 
I want to give you the inverse of that. When we're working, go to hell. We're working on a 21 Jump Street. There's one episode that we worked on where we watched it after the first cut. We were like, oh my god, this is awful, awful. Let's just cut out all the shit. Cut out all the shit. We'll start over. We'll start, you know. So we cut out all the shit. The episode is 20 minutes short. <laughs> <laughs> Flynn, tell about calling and telling me when you had to cut like a minute out of my regression scene and feel where I died. Because I was it's, it's a moment was filming them and I go and you know each act was I think that's an, was an act three which is usually about eight or nine minutes <laughs> and they film when they film that they did David's first. And so I, I, I go to, I got there a little late, and then the company comes up to me and goes, I did the regression scene, I'm like, it was good. And I, immediately I'm like, yeah, how long was it? So it was about 11 minutes. I'm like, oh. And then Chris says I was there, and I think that was eight minutes. And so I know the two of them had done this magnificent performance, each of them. But I knew right then on set that you were going to cut something. And, you know, it's probably three or four weeks later, and you're in the editing room and you go, the, the day has arrived. <laughs> lose that, lose that, and I had to go home and go, look, I had to cut this. And, um, you know, I think uh, Kristen has learned a lot hanging around us knuckleheads about what... You know, everybody goes to a movie or watch a TV show because of actors, no doubt. But they're really just a tip of the iceberg of a production. And so she's, she sees, I think if she you know, say, hey, I had to cut that now, be a little bit more of an understanding, but the company too is like, you know, he, he, he believed that crying scenes are what got you an Emmy nomination. Don't touch him. And so jump in here because you know we're talking. This, I'm glad you brought that up because you're talking a lot about writing and beforehand, but with editing, they all had very distinct personalities, and like Heather seemed to hate the show, like she would always like, why is that smell on, like, you know, and that, that was kind of a good process, because you had someone, and she's the one who won the Emmy, and she was kind of tough on us, and then there was a guy Heather saying, was tough on everyone. Huh? Heather was tough, Heather was tough on everyone. You really like go, oh, here we go, you better know why you want to do a cut. Jim, got all this guy, Steve Marks and Jim, were probably the two most blunt, human beings on earth, and they go, shit, cut that out, this shit. Uh, I think the only episode I remember that a director turned in that you really didn't have to do too much was on ice, and, and Steve and, you know, I would just go, those two got it down and, and leave. Now, I, I think because one of the more interesting experiences for me was on Cutting Home, the editor was this guy Michael Stern. His father was Leonard Stern, who was the showrunner, executive producer of Get Smart, so his father is like, you know, it's sacred to me. And Michael had been on the show Sequest, and he had left because he had gotten in fistfights with Roy Scheider. <laughs> and so he, had, he said, I got an anger thing. I'm like, okay, nicest guy. But he said, I got an anger thing. I go, okay, and so we're cutting home, and I knew we were gonna have some issues. And so because we were friends with what's called the Standards and Practices uh, Executive, who's the people call her the censor, or her name was Linda Shimatsuno, and she came in and she was this nice, nice little lady, and she came in and we cut the scene where they come, the wonderful, wonderful, where they kill the sheriff with Standards and Practices. She was on the couch. And we had rules like in baseball that if you broke your wrist, and you call the strike, we would roll back the footage like that. You never saw contact. <laughs> All kinds of rules. She's like, no, no. And we were just, it wasn't arguing, but we really worked with, I, I've never done that before or since. So she was involved in that. The other thing with Michael, because a lot of TV editors hadn't done horror or suspense, you know, they're doing cop shows mainly. And Michael, uh, he went, He's at the machine and I'm at his back. And, it, and I'm like, oh yeah, well, yeah go the door knock. Oh, go the door knock. He's like, he doesn't look around, he's like, just, he's like, but it doesn't do anything. I'm like, I know. People wait for 
for it to turn. The next time you come back, don't let it turn again. And he's just standing there, and then I go, oh, he's going to beat me up. <laughs> but then all of a sudden he's like, oh. And then just starts editing and does like four or five like really great cuts, and you go, oh, okay, the light is clicked on for this guy. And so when that episode came out, and we all know what happened on that episode, and it got pulled the most ardent defender of that episode was Standards and Practices. She would like get letters saying, I do not appreciate watching a human's brain spill out on the floor on my television. And she goes, it never happened. But she learned a lesson on what an audience spills in, you know, and uh, that was like really a, an interesting experience. But that editing the shows is like very, and each one was yeah, kind of different. So you had to ask the editor to do comedy. And, uh, you know, and then when we came back, we had this editor, Eleanor and Fonte, we used to argue as to who would get Eleanor to cut the episode, and she cut Kristen's episode, and you just like, you have a great editor, you just watch it cut, and you're like, I, I think I directed that, and I'm like, who shot that? Where'd that come from? And that's how good they are, is that they find stuff that you didn't know was there. Uh, speaking of uh, autoerotic, it's just that's a good segue. Stephen Hart uh, cut Clive Barker. And that scene with autoerotic excruciation, I can't say. Uh, I would like to point out, though, uh, I. Careful. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was thinking about this. I was thinking about this this morning when I was on my nature walk. Uh, when that episode aired, I don't think probably 80% of the people knew what auto association it was. And I think I, I made it popular. <laughs> uh, that episode, the editor was, was Stephen Mark on, on that, and he, to this day, whenever I see this scene, uh, Peter Bowie goes, uh, I can't take him more, I'm taking five with the auto-association, and then, and then, uh, Mulder goes, why are you saying, why are you talking that? And he goes, oh, forget, forget I mentioned it. And then the company, Peter Bowie's here, Scully's driving, and then the company goes like this, right? He looks over at Scully. I didn't, there was a reaction shot of Scully, right? I didn't want to go to it, because, Scully's driving, which just sort of made her eyes big. Uh, and uh, this goes to the com kind of comedy thing. I was so sensitive, even though it was the second episode. So many people were touchy about uh, humbug and comedy. That, that was one of the things when I did Clyde Park, when I, I go, it's, it's funny, there's jokes, but I wanted to, I don't want it to be seen too broad or too wacky. And I thought Jillian's uh, reaction was just too, too broad. Like she, looked, she made her eyes too big. But whenever I watch that scene nowadays, Mulder looks over and I go, ah, I should have cut the skelly. Well, it just haunts me and I always have to go, no, no, I thought her reaction was too big and it probably wasn't. But it's those weird little like editing things, the editor like, and Stephen kept going, no, I should cut the skelly. And I was like, no, I was adamant, but like, I should have listened to him. I should have listened to him. You know, it's like, uh, uh Jim directed Musings of the Cats kind of, and I just like, he got an Emmy nomination. And I was like, I really researched a lot of stuff, and it was really late. And, you know, you take it for granted now. He had to do like, you're in Vancouver, Dallas in 63, uh, Memphis in 68. I don't, you know, I don't know what's the middle one. Who else did kill Then in the middle one, they had the middle one, and you've got, you know, and, period pieces and stuff, and he just like getting pages and shooting them. And I, I really, I really love that episode, and Jim's directing on that is just sensational. But he had, uh, the Memphis is in black and white, and there's a long crane, you know, we still, I'll be on shows now, we got on a different production, and like see a crane, and I'm like, oh, is your mom directing this episode? <laughs> and it's like magnificent crane shot. Uh, there was a garbage strike at that time, and they had garbage and paper and everything. It's just like great. And then you're wrong. I'm like, oh, I gotta go yeah. down the hall. And <laughs> oh, he doesn't hold the grudge. Uh, I had to go down the hall and go. I gotta cut the first half of your crane shot because we're wrong, and it's.
it's beautiful, and I know it took hours to set up, but it's not <laughs> advancing the story. And, you know, you gotta... It was advancing the mood of the scene. <laughs> Um, you know, while I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about, um, just quickly, because you guys are here and, you know, we, we're really grateful that you're here, but how much, um, you know, you guys end up playing a role in our lives. Like, we would not be here if it wasn't for Avi. And Avi, you know, is <laughs> really closely with Frank and she's, you know, she's a, a, someone who loved the show but now is a friend and part of our lives and, you know, I, I had said before that I wanted to mention Julie. Julie and Glenn have this really funny, great relationship. She's become kind of like a family member and she was what they call a Wong's, Wong's guitar at the time. <laughs> it's been a message boards and uh, Glenn and Julie have this really funny relationship where, you know, like in Darren, you know, Glenn keeps mentioning Darren's episode where he'll be like, well, what happened was, and then Julie will be like, <laughs> so, you know, just to, you know, and then, you know, I see friends out here that I'm friends with on Twitter or, you know, we've done podcast episodes together and, you know, I obviously was not as involved with the show as, as these guys, but, you know, have I feel like I've made friends and, you know, we're all here in this room together and we're sitting up here with microphones, but, you know, how much of an influence you guys have had on our lives as well, you know, just little things here and there. So, just wanted to, just before we all break up, just to say thank you and just to let you guys know how much you influence, you know, little things in our lives all the time. So. Beyond the Sea, and uh, I remember uh, Rick, 
always said to us, he was like, okay, this guy's coming in, he, he doesn't read well. So you have to, so it's Brad Dourif. And he's great, he's amazing, but he doesn't audition well at all. You know, I don't know, whatever. And he comes in, he's not, he's terrible. <laughs> and, and Rick said, you have to, you have to cast him. He's, yeah, but sorry, what for the Cuckoo's Nest is like, yeah, that's one of my favorite yeah, movies. So we go, yeah, okay, all right. I, this is, I don't know if we can do this, but you know, we cast them and we see the dailies, and it's like the most amazing performance. And that was the moment where I go, wow, you have to trust all these people. Not only Brad to be able to do it, because we know he can do it, but he, although he didn't show us in the room, but also Rick and all these other people who really have the best interests of the show in mind. They just have to convince you. Sorry, so, and sorry, no, no, don't forget. That they were like, no, because Brad Dourif, he's an Academy Award nominee, he had been one of the stars of Ragtime. They were like, no, he's too much. Like, no, you gotta get Brad Dourif. So Jim and I went there and said, we'll give our script fee to get Brad Dourif. And if you offer your own money, they think you're nuts. <laughs> and they know you really mean it. And Chris called Peter Roth on Thanksgiving night or something. And so we got to have it. Peter Roth was probably so annoyed to have this thing to He agreed to it. And I think that's another moment by Chris calling. That was another moment that kicked the show into high gear because that other actors of that caliber yeah. can look at the show in a different light. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I forgot all these little, like, like I said, you're old. Yeah, well, but uh, yeah, those are the kind of things that, you know, they're not the big, oh my God, life changing moment where you think, uh, it's great. It's just these things that you, you realize later on that it, they add up to what made the show the show. So, uh, you uh, when you asked the question, you said, it was there a moment you said, I can't believe I'm getting paid. Okay, this is the actual quote we were doing for Head Sweat with Craig Robleski, who was the, the director of photography. And we had an alien. Uh, with Elvis Cake, <laughs> and that actor had been in, made up because it, it, it takes so long to. So he had the makeup on and he had the costume. When we first showed up on the set and we were block, trying to figure out blocking the scene, that little scooter that we had the alien ride after he goes down the escalator, that was the actor's scooter. That's how he got and he was just, we were on a, a mountaintop field. And he was just riding around on that. He was just riding around. And I, I, go, I go, look at this, look at this. We have to use this. We have to use this. This is the funniest thing I've ever seen. And so we, we incorporated that on the spot. And he gets on the escalator and he gets on the scooter. So when we were, when we were finally filming that, me, me and Craig, we were laughing so hard. We were laughing so hard. And then Craig turned to me and goes, I can't believe we're getting paid to shoot this. <laughs> and that's what the executives are going to say when they see the news. <laughs> that was Kurt, he's not joking, that was Kurt Russell's cane at 3,000 miles to Graceland. That was that what they, I, I remember the costume said, I, I have the, I have the cane because she had worked on side in front of the Yeah, then, uh, now they take the props and the auction them off, but if you were smart, you took, I've, I've been starting to like swipe props, <laughs> and, uh, like one or whatever for everything. And Darren one day goes, um, those years go by. He's like, I really regret not taking the Voyager record from that show. And I'm like, oh, I was on Twilight Zone, same prop guy, this guy, Tyler, right? Tyler. And I go into my office, and on the desk is this Voyager record. I'm like, hey Tyler, did, did we talk about this? He's like, no, I was going through the warehouse and I saw it and I thought Darren might like it. I'm like, I saw him this weekend. And he's been, said he regretted it. So I gave it to him for Christmas, I think. <laughs> I also have the, the book, All the Answers. <laughs> so, and I gave Lanny to it. Yeah, well, Chris gave me, Chris gave me the, the, the monster and humbug, the little twin. Uh, I, I, I used to, uh, Halloween, sit him in the chair, <laughs> put the candy ball in his lap. And people have to reach in, and, and 
I always just wanted someone to go, oh my god, it's Monster from the Classic X Files. <laughs> no one ever did. Closest thing anybody ever said was, some guy just went, what the hell is that? <laughs> my, my dog ate one of his, its foot. <laughs> I think the thing that <clears throat> made me, you know, two stories um, for RM9 for sure, when, you know, I had written that teaser of the, um, the sushi, um, I wouldn't take, but I had also written the sushi, the whole sushi thing. And um, when we were doing the read through, uh, Mark Freeborn, who was a production designer, who he, we had worked with before, a brilliant guy, worked on Breaking Bad, and he just, just a genius, and uh, he made fun of my description. You know, it's all description, that show. It's, there's no dialogue in it. So, you know, you're trying to describe what you want it to feel like and look like, even though those words are really never going to be the thing, but it's just sort of a guide. And, Mark made fun of me at the read-through, like, this is really overwritten, this is, not, I, this is, helps me not at all, you know, so. <laughs> then we went, we were location scouting, and we went to this um, abandoned mini-mall sporting goods store, and it was trashed, it was moldy, it was just a disgusting room that was just nothing, and we talked about what the sushi restaurant would look like. And a few days later, we went back, and I got choked up when I walked in. It was the most beautiful thing. It was so far beyond my imagination of what it would look like and be like. And it was so moving to see that come to life. I mean, for me, I, I think it was just one of those moments where, um, even though I've always really fought um, wanting to be a writer. I think, you, I'm sure there's a lot of you guys, you know, you want to write, but you just think you'll never really have the confidence to put it out there. And, um, I'm really lucky to have Glenn as a best friend to always push me and make me do it. Um, and so, when you, but when you have those moments and you go, oh, I should do this more often. This is amazing. <laughs> you know, but it was because of Mark and his incredible team really bringing that to life. And then I try to think of Field Where I Died. I've told this a couple times. Like it's really hard for me to remember doing that because it was really painful. But something, um, when you work, especially if you guest on a show, when you are doing your close-ups, so often, most times, the lead does their close-ups first. Even though my thing was like crying all day and painful, it's just always, just the pecking order. The, it's just the respect to the to the standing cast that they always go first. And so um, sometimes, so I would want them to be able to react to whatever I was gonna do. So that meant just doing sometimes these. You know, the the impetus to change character was pain. So you'd have to do this and then you'd feel pain, and then you'd switch characters to protect the character before, right? So that character started to feel weird, and then, you know, because uh, Scully or Mulder <coughs> were asking her questions, and then she'd change. So it was really kind of, those were the best experiences, not when I was on camera, but when I was doing it for David and Jillian so that they could have so that we weren't working together. And I wasn't on camera, so I was still going through the um, through the steps of that character for them, and I got to watch them respond. And I think to me, even though it's hard to remember it all, th those were the act, that was the acting experience of that show that was really the most gratifying is when I was working with them, but I wasn't seen on camera. I, and it was fun to do that with them. They were, they were, um, they were appreciative and, and kind and supportive. So I thought, well, that, that was, just so you guys know, they were lovely. <laughs> <laughs>
Any last questions? Uh, from all the episodes you wrote for Millennium and X-Files, um, is there one specific episode which is your favorite or which you are the most proud of for all of you? The giant clam episode. <laughs> So I, 
I might find it's really difficult to go, this is my favorite, or this, because some, I might objectively be able to go, I think this one's better than that one, this, but like Jose Chung for me, uh, for a lot of just various reasons, just everything kind of came together, and just the whole thing, just everything just sort of, <clears throat> see like, <clears throat> so like Jose Chung for me is always like, can you tell the Alex and Trevor? I need more lines. Uh, well, Alex, that's when I, this is when I knew I was like becoming a producer. <laughs> was we finally, you know, I had to figure out who, someone asked me this uh, yesterday at the signing, like, uh, was Alex Trebek the first choice? or And it was originally Salman Rushdie. <laughs> <laughs> Salman Rushdie who met Black and then Glenn said, no, it should be Johnny Cash. But yes, that's, that makes sense, that's great. We couldn't get Johnny Cash, and so then we, we went through trying to figure out like a celebrity that would be funny men in black. And it was me and Jeff Flaming was one of our staff records at the time. He uh, passed away earlier this year, and he was from in his, uh, he would have loved being here. But we were, me and Jeff were just sitting in his office, like throwing out names, throwing out names, and finally he just goes, uh, Alice Trebek, we go, that's it, that's it. And the company had been on, Jeopardy, Soldier's Jeopardy that year, so we can get him. We got him in. So we ended up getting Alex Trebek, but, but before he agreed to do it, uh, I was in the office and the, the, one of the assistants comes in and goes, um, Alex Trebek is on the phone, he wants to speak with you. Like, I'm not here, I'm not here. <laughs> so I go, uh, hello? He goes, hi, I'm Alex. He goes, uh, you know, yeah, I'm, you know, this is a very you know, interesting thing, but like, I have to like, uh, in order to do this, uh, it takes a day to fly up there, a day to shoot, a day to come home, it's like a long time. Could I have more than one line? Right? And I didn't want that character to have more than one line, it only needs that one line. So I go, and I didn't want to go, no, no, get the one line, be happy. <laughs> you have to do it like him. No, sorry, sorry. That's, that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so what I said, what I said is, I go, you know, the problem is, I would love to give you more lines, but your voice is so recognizable that if they just hear you, they will know it's you, and I can't have them know it's you until you reveal that it's you. So I, I just, I can't, because your voice is that famous. And there was a pause, and then you went, okay. <laughs> That's when I go, I'm a producer now. <laughs> David Coveney is the only actor I've ever worked with that does not fall for that shit. <laughs> they, they were actually really happy with our episode that they had no dialogue. They were like, yippee skippy. <laughs> they had no lines to memorize. They were like really, they were, they a, were pretty in a pretty good mood. During. He has that line. <laughs> in her house and all hell's breaking loose and he's like, why is your house nicer than mine? <laughs> yeah. And that was David's improv. <laughs> and it was so funny we kept it in even though we were strictly like no dialogue, but he's just really funny. I think for me, uh, you know, the, like I said, I can't remember anything. <laughs> but for me, my favorite thing, and it's sort of not because of the episode, but because of the sentiment behind it, um, when we did uh, the end of the list, um, you know, at the end, it was our last episode of X Files until the return, uh, and we were going off to do other things and stuff. And we had the last, the, what the what the witch wrote on the board, which was "What's <coughs> working with you," was really our sentiment to everybody uh, that we worked with on, on the show. So it, it sort of touches me. It makes it. It makes me kind of, I don't know, cry. It makes, it makes me feel this kind of sentiment every time I see it that, you know, that was our kind of goodbye to the show. And so I kind of. You want one more? <laughs> we came back and ruined it. I think we're supposed to be done now. Yeah. <laughs>